You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Hello and welcome to Why We Do What We Do. This is Abraham and my co-host, Ryan O. And we have a special guest today. Uh, Her name is Lauren. Say hi, Lauren. Hello. Um, And so we invited Lauren here today because we wanted to talk about gender issues, and uh, we're not as much of an expert at this as, uh, as Lauren is. So we asked Lauren to come in, answer some questions for us, and uh, impart some wisdom on us. And so um, let's actually start by uh, just give a little bit of background um, on yourself, Lauren. I currently teach uh, psychology of gender at the University of Nevada, Reno, and have taught it quite a bit. So I have got very interested in the subject and have found it to be kind of fascinating to talk about and research. And so that was mostly just kind of thrown at you, right? You didn't like get your degree in gender studies or anything like that? No, no. Um, My degree's in psychology. All right. So I don't know a whole lot about this topic. And one of the first things I ran into when I was looking around was that there's differences between sex and gender. So maybe we can start there. What do you think? Yeah, let's let's do that. Okay, so which which is so we're we're focusing on gender. So let's maybe start with sex. Like, what is that? Uh, so when people talk about sex, even though a lot of times this can be misconstrued, uh, generally you're talking about the biological makeup of an individual that makes them either male or female. So speaking like technically in the scientific sense, that's what sex refers to. That would include their the primary sex characteristics, which are absence or presence of a penis or vagina, um, and then there's secondary sex characteristics, so that would be breasts, facial hair, different things like that. And so which aspect of sex refers to, like, the chromosomes and, like, hormones and stuff like that? The, the, the androgens? Sure. Is that primary or secondary? Uh, primary. Okay. And so, okay. What is, what's an androgen? Androgen is just the uh, blanket term to refer to either testosterone or estrogen. Okay. or any other hormones that a person might have in their body. Okay, perfect. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's sex. And, yeah. how, and, mm-hmm. so that, and this is different from gender, technically speaking. So gender is more the social constructs around uh, ways that we classify males or females. Uh, is completely dependent upon one's culture and social, other psychological factors. Okay, what do you mean by psychological factors? This is essentially how a person identifies themselves. Okay. That makes sense. And it may or may not, uh, so to speak, match with their biological sex. Okay. Uh, Can you say more about that? So, in general, people will refer to a person's gender or people whose gender matches or does not match their biological sex will either be called uh, cisgender if you if your biological sex and your identified gender match okay uh and transgender if they do not match Uh, i hate using the word match just because it assumes that sex is black and white and gender itself is black and white right so there's Uh, like a correct or incorrect answer to yes essentially um and most of the time it's based on assumptions um that You know, I can see somebody and identify that they are either male or female, and they are acting either like a male or a female. Um, So it depends, again, entirely upon cultural and social factors that uh, each person is a part of. Okay, so just to recap then, sex is the biological characteristics that are either male or female, and gender is the social... um, or cultural behaviors that are ident- that are re- referred to as either being masculine or feminine. Is that correct? Yes, although sex isn't, uh, although a little more clear-cut is, isn't necessarily 100% clear-cut as to whether someone's 100% male, 100% female, just because there are a lot of chromosomal issues. There are uh, issues around the androgens that a person's exposed to. There, um, so for example, there's triple X syndrome that a female fetus might have. Um, Kleinfelter syndrome is uh, XXY chromosomes, I believe. Okay. 
Um, and so if, just for people who may not know, a typical, I guess you could call it typical, if that's appropriate. Typically developing. Yeah. Fetus. So if it was female, then it would just be an X, two X chromosomes, yes. and a male would just have one X and one and an, uh, one Y chromosome, so an XY. Yes. And uh, so a, a triple X would be, um, as you were saying, just, uh, what was that one called? Uh, just triple X. Oh, it's triple X, okay. <laughs> Return of Xander Cage. Um, so the okay. triple X is where there are then three of the X chromosomes present, and then uh, what was the Klein filters? Uh, XXY. If they have that arrangement of chromosomes, do they, how, how are they classified? Is that they fall into male or female? So with Klinefelter syndrome, the fetus is considered a male but is born with an extra X chromosome. And so they will likely, um, again, have a penis, but they might have uh, reduced muscle mass, less facial hair, less body hair as a result. Um, and it can produce little or no sperm. Turner syndrome, XO, so that's the absence of a Y or an X chromosome, so the fetus is born looking female-like, um, but being very short, short in stature and having kind of some other developmental issues. I say. So there's only one sex chromosome in an yeah. XO. Mm -hmm. Is there is there ever a case where there's zero sex chromosomes? I don't think so. I think okay. there's usually at least one. How many variations on like sex chromosome? arrangements can you have? There's quite a few. Um, there are kind of the typical, so XXY Klein filters. Um, there's uh, two Y chromosomes that people talk about, um, triple X, Turner, Turner syndrome, and then sometimes there are mosaics, so sometimes there end up being like four or more. Wow. Um, so a whole bunch of different sex chromosomes. It's not exist. super common, but it does happen, which then puts that person in the situation where are you a male or female and technically if you're not xy or x x um, a lot of times you fall outside of the societal standards of what you should be if you're embracing both masculine and feminine characteristics okay um oh that's a great question so one of the things i was going to um ask is for these people who have these sort of variations in their chromosome development are they able to reproduce it completely depends on the situation. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess just anything else. So let's move into, I want to discuss with you how we can understand like the behavior of individuals with respect to their sex and gender. So if someone's born um, biologically with a penis versus biologically with a vagina, uh, what, can we, what, what can we expect in terms of their behavior? What are, To what extent are they predisposed well, to behave one really way or another, um, depending on what they're born with? Has shown, and there are a lot of um, really good books out there if, if anyone's interested on gender. Um, Cordelia Fine has a book called Delusions of Gender that's really good. Um, Carol Tavris wrote Mismeasure of Woman. She talks a lot about the research around uh, gendered studies and how a lot of Research has really kind of come at it from a very sexist perspective. And it's called and mansplaining. And, and then Anne Foster getting results that are very sexist. It's also very good. Uh, so historically, to, to answer that question, there you would get different answers depending upon the, at the time at which you were born, essentially. So historically, there were a lot of assumptions that because one was born male or female, they were going to behave differently. Um, and research, again, around that time would kind of show that because there was a lot of male influence on what was going to be the outcome. Um, and, you know, one's gendered expectations really showed up a lot in that research. Uh, however, today, and really what we're finding more and more is that it is incredibly difficult to make a decision about how biologically predisposed one is going to be to engage in certain behaviors whether they are male or female, um, without considering the social constructions around essentially their life history, what they've been told is appropriate or not appropriate for their particular sex. So, Ryan, let me bring you in on this. What have you heard in terms of who's going to be better at, like, what? what who, male's going to be better at what? Female's going to be better at X. So... Even if it's a stereotype, even if you know if it's wrong, what, yeah. what, what, do you, what have you heard? What, what exists out there? Males are better at uh, anything that requires a lot more physical exertion, for okay. example. 
whether that's working at a construction site mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. or sports related things, mm-hmm. right? Okay. That's one that I heard a lot growing up. Academic tasks, mental abilities, that sort of thing. These are hard. So I, I don't believe that these things hold true right. at all. So I just want to make that clear. But um, I've heard that, again, certain areas of study are more for women versus men. Um, our field that I'm in myself, like there's a lot more women that are in that field mm-hmm. than there are men. And actually the positions held at different levels of education vary mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. Where you'll have more men at the PhD level um, and then much more women at the practitioner level. Okay, like a master's degree and below. Yeah, or even, yeah. So if you can speak to, is it reasonable to assume that someone will be stronger because they're male than female? Well, again, to go back to gendered expectations, a lot of times people are, especially parents, uh, new parents out there, are gendering whether they are meaning to or not. A lot of times just by your reactions to one child over the other, um, dependent upon whether they're male or female. Um, And even just things like pushing them to uh, continue on in sports, for example, is more likely to happen for male children, which, you know, as a result could end up in uh, different outcomes for males and females. And currently and historically, this has always been the case that uh, males are physically stronger. Um, They tend to have more muscle mass, they tend to be able to lift more heavy things, but again, a lot of that can be based on the social constructions around how males and females are supposed to behave. Um, One really cool kind of analogy that Foster Sterling actually uses in her book is she calls it like the unbound foot metaphor, and she talks about how with respect to marathon running, for example, uh, males in around just after the 1900s started, they started actually running marathons. Um, and so for about 60 years past that, a uh, little less than 60, their women weren't allowed to participate. And so in the late 60s, I believe, uh, they did allow women to start running the marathon. And what was interesting is naturally the women's times were much higher than the males. Um, And even from like the male kind of starting points when they first started running in the 1900s, but their rate of decline for how fast they were getting uh, was much steeper. steeper. It was much steeper than the males had been over time. So decline meaning improvement in their running times. exactly. And so her whole analogy and reason for using the unbound foot was talking about when you actually are allowing women to participate in things and you're actually promoting that they are able to do things similar to males, uh, you see differences and you see their biology responding as a function of allowing them to participate in more sports and more um, activity levels, essentially. So the opportunity to actually practice the same skill reduces that sexual dimorphism which is a term I guess we haven't defined yet, that refers to the extent to which in a species the male and female genders are physiologically different from one another. Um, And in some species there's a very large disparity in size, color, shape, various things. And in humans, most of us, the sexual dimorphism isn't isn't particularly apparent. Um, I mean, it is to some extent. There are obviously some physical factors that are so much more likely to show up in women, the presence of breasts, a vagina, that sort of thing. Um, But in overall size and shape, um, the the differences that exist exist primarily on average, correct? Yes. And um, so one thing I've heard, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, is that the averages within a given like sex or gender are larger than the averages across the two. So there's more, Often. yeah, more variation in like height, weight, and size in, in males and in females than there is across the two in general. Like the overlap mm-hmm. is huge. Yes. Um, and you could very easily have a woman who's taller, stronger, faster, and better in every way than a counterpart that would be male who just happens to be shorter, smaller, weaker, and, and maybe intellectually delayed in some way. And so just having the, uh, the genitalia, does, like just because you have a penis doesn't mean you're going to be good at anything. Yeah. Well, in Hall, um, Harriet Hall, who, wrote, who writes for the Skeptic magazine, she has a really great quote. She says, group, gender differences are group differences. They tell us nothing about the individual. Okay. So 
I guess then the overall uh, sort of conclusion or take home from that is we can't really expect any type of be- anything in particular from someone just based on their sex. Is that correct? Based on their sex, no, but you can, depending on what culture they're raised in. Okay. Um, and, it, you know, that would be the same for if you raise a child in a religious household or a non-religious household. Um, those children are likely to embrace those same ideologies that they were raised with. And so if you see a heavy enforcement of gender roles where males are allowed to participate in a lot of activity, um, you know, maybe push to continue their education and the females kind of expected to just be a mother or be at home, you're likely to see those individuals behaving that way because of those expectations. Would you make the case then that how their parents respond to them when they're young has a major influence on how they turn out like gender wise as they grow older? Absolutely. Cause I certainly, I know that there are certain parents who have made the claim. I, you know, I treated my children completely the same. Mm-hmm. I didn't like limit them or, or talk to them any differently than one another, even though I had a boy and a girl. Mm-hmm. And so what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and again, uh, and uh, a lot of authors have kind of made this point too. It comes down to you're always going to be exposed to social roles. So even if you were able to control for the parenting being exactly the same, which it never really is, <laughs> um, and some people do very well about keeping kind of very consistent rules around what you know children can and can't do, um, they're still going to be part of a culture where they're expected to behave differently. They're going to have friends growing up who also will uh, reinforce essentially gendered norms. Um, they'll the kids very early on data show you know they play with uh, same gendered groups or same sex groups I should say, and they tend to do that kind of all throughout school. And what? So they're exposed to a lot of those expectations in some way, even if it's not the appearance. And even before before we started recording, you had mentioned about how when like an infant were to fall over, um, how people treat them differently. And I know I heard about a study where they had a baby and they handed it off to different people and they either pretended it was a boy or pretended it was a girl. And then people uh, reacted differently to it. Oh, yeah. So quite a few researchers have actually done studies around this, but C.V. Katz and Zolk kind of following up from some talk of from Lewis Gould, who talked about gender-neutral parenting, kind of a fictional story. Um, they tried to see how people would behave differently if an infant, if they told, were told that the infant was either male or female, or not told if, of the gender of the baby. And essentially, they behaved differently um, in, with that child. They were asked to interact with it and were given the option of choosing some different toys that they could use with the baby. And... A lot of times with the male baby, they were more likely to choose the football-shaped toy, even though it was a very tiny child. And with the female, kind of chose more um, dolls and different things like that. Uh, and what about the the uh, where like a kid like falls down, and um, and then the parents respond to it differently depending on whether it's male or female. Uh, so that's just I do know one of that's very interesting. They essentially did um, observation of parents and their children in museums and they found that the parents were more likely to explain a lot of the scientific processes and different things that were going on in the museum to their male children than their female children. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, just go through a few things where one might believe or there might even be some data to suggest that males or females, they are different on, on, on certain tasks. And one I know I've heard a lot about is like visual, spatial sort of recognition tasks. And um, do, is there some research around who should be better at that and why? Yeah. So a lot of the research on gender and education, I mean, that that could be a really long discussion. Um, so some of the historical assumptions are that males are better at math, uh, females are better at reading, writing, and then males also being better at visual, spatial learning, which is similar to, again, math. Um, and there, the data does suggest that and has suggested it for a while, but what you see is over time that gap is lessening, and you see that as um, more females are admitted into higher level math classes, um, a lot of those gender expectations are kind of changing and policies are supporting different uh, 
var variety groups in classrooms, you see that gap just decreasing over time. Uh, so while data has historically supported that, um, it again kind of goes back to if you're not allowed to learn it, you know, you're, you're going to expect that you're going to be bad at it. So um, given, the, given the opportunity to participate, everyone, it ends up washing out and being pretty much the same. Exactly. Um, and Fine, in her book, actually uses a really good example. Historically, around the 17th century, there was a lot of discussion around whether women could be allowed in politics and one excuse they kind of used for not having women in politics is that they didn't know about politics. Um, but then that went back to they weren't allowed to participate in it. So if you know nothing about something because you haven't been allowed to participate, um, yeah, you're going to know nothing about it when you come into the situation. So. Well, and then let's go about the other direction in that shouldn't women then – uh, or one of the, the things you, you mentioned previously is that men are not as good naturally at being nurturing and being caregivers and that women are naturally better at that. Is there some truth to that? Well, there's a lot of research around um, hormones and kind of like surge of hormones being linked to to mothers being very motherly when their baby comes out and even before that when they kind of prepare for baby. Um, and that's not to say those hormones don't play a big role. They really do. But what's interesting, for example, uh, Rosenblatt in 1967 did a study where they had some newborn rat pups um, and they removed the mother and they put the father in that situation. Now the father rat like literally does and never participates in the parenting and it also doesn't experience kind of this hormonal surge of maternal um, estrogen and all that kind of stuff. And the father in that situation, again, because these pups needed a parent, it started taking on all the roles that the mother usually did, which include a lot of licking. That's something that rats do a lot of when they're um, with their baby pups and just trying to take care of them as much as possible. Wow. Why do you think that is? Again, it's just uh, life circumstances. You know, you will behave differently. And the same can be said of just new fathers. Um, you know, you don't have to have birthed something to love it and to feel kind of that bond with it and to be able to take on those roles of nurturing. Women can also be non-nurturing. Okay. Um, so a good example, Mare wrote a book on the Amazonian women. Um, and again, in this culture, the expectations were that everyone hunted. And so what you saw was women got very, um, developed some kind of masculine features. They were very muscular. They looked very similar to the males in their culture. Um, and what was interesting is they actually often didn't raise their babies when they had them. They would actually sometimes, um, because they hunted with a bow a lot, bow and arrow, they sometimes would remove the breast on the side where they were um, shooting from to facilitate hunting. Um, and so again, it, it really just goes back to it's not necessarily biological that you're going to be um, maternal or not maternal. Um, but it really speaks to like what the culture is is saying is important and individual factors. I suppose it certainly could be the case that you have a mother who is terrible at being a mother while the, the father of the child is actually really good at being a parent. Yeah. So I guess what what is there to know? Like what, what would you like people to know about gender and, and gender studies and stuff that, that probably most people don't really know about? Well, that, there's a lot to that question. Um. I think one of the biggest points that a lot of gender researchers really point out is before we jump to saying that something is a ma masculine or feminine behavior or assuming that people are going to be better at or worse than the other based on whatever the task is, um, is to look at the social environment, is really to look at, you know, what's their history um, are they not able to do this because I haven't really taught them or I haven't s spent a lot of time getting them familiar with this particular subject, different things like that. So I'd like to talk a little bit about sexuality and mostly just in the sense of most people identify that there's homosexuality and heterosexuality and that's kind of it. But as I understand it, there's a little bit more to it than that. And it's maybe as complex or more complex than the range in genders that can exist in terms of the chromosomal differences that can exist and even some of the physical differences that can exist. 
Um, and uh, so let's actually talk about like what what is sort of the range in gender that can exist and how that might be different again, across different cultures, and then the range of sexuality and how that can be different even within a culture. Yeah, again, that's it's going to depend on what culture you're a part of. In our culture, um, most people have probably heard of like LGBT community. Um, Any more, the kind of more technical term is LGBTQIA plus community. It's a lot of initials. Uh, it is. Um, so just to go in order, so it's a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual. Um, and then the plus kind of indicating, and there are lots of others. Um, yeah. And really, this community is, is trying to point out that there are many different sexualities, and people can identify as, you know, any either of those. And within that, I know that there's even some variation in terms of you might have someone who identifies as heterosexual, but even that doesn't mean the same thing for every person who identifies as heterosexual. If we have two males who identify as heterosexual, one might be might have like a particular fetish Mm -hmm. or one might be um, that they're heterosexual, but they don't particularly actually enjoy having sex. And so they don't have, they maybe choose a celibacy. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and what, what are some other variations that might exist or like what's, what kind of range could you even look at that would be differentiation? So a lot of times researchers have, and they've done a good job, but it it just points out how complicated it is. Um, They talk about sexuality as a spectrum and so ranging, just really pointing out that every person's going to be very different and is going to identify uh, differently than another person. Um, and really, uh, what's interesting, too, is I've come into contact with students who will ask things, usually about individuals who identify as transgender. They'll say, you know, what do I call this person? And I will kind of ask them, you know, okay, so let's take an example here. Um, You meet a person named Robert, and uh, sometimes with your history, you know that people named Robert go by either Rob, Bob, Robert. Uh, Maybe they go by their middle name. There's kind of a variety there. Um, And under those circumstances, you essentially just ask them what they want to be called. And so I, I will tell them a lot of times that it's just asking, ask what they want to be called and call them that. Uh, and still, a lot of times people will still say, well, but what do I say? Do I say he or she? And it's like, you need to ask that person. And it's going to depend entirely on that person. Some people will um, identify as uh, transsexual or transgender and, you know, either they'll want to be called Um, of the gender they're portraying or not. Uh, It completely depends on the person. And probably the most compassionate response is just to ask that person what they want to be called and how they like to be addressed. Um, Some groups that meet will go by, they'll introduce themselves, kind of like if you're doing a round robin of saying, you know, my name is Jennifer. Um, They'll also then interject the correct gendered pronouns that they would use. So I'd say, my name is Jennifer, she, her, for okay. example. And so whenever you refer to that person, that that's the gender pronouns they want you to use. Just because you mentioned this a few times, it's the correct use is transgender and not transgen- transgendered, correct? Yeah. So in general, it, it implies just as I don't say I'm mailed or I'm femaled, <laughs> It doesn't imply that it's just something that happened. It implies like an ongoing status. Okay. This is who I am. This is how I identify. And some people who uh, technically might be transgender, maybe they were born uh, biologically a male and later decided to have surgery to become a female, they might not identify as transgender. They might identify as a female because that's what they are now. And again, it all just depends entirely on the person. And some people always identify as transgender even if they don't don't go through the full surgery. Yet. Okay. So it, it's all about just being aware of what people want to be called and being nice about it, essentially. That's just a funny <laughs> way of thinking about it. My gender just happened to me. It's like hitting the face, boom, female <laughs> happened. And another one with respect to the whole sexuality thing is, uh, I mean, is it the case that males are just more sexually engaged, more sexually active? Like they, there's the whole stereotype of, well, and I think you can see this in going to bars that women get in free 
um, mm-hmm. because um, men are just walking erections looking for a female. Um, so what is there in this in the difference between males and females in terms of their overall sexuality and their expression of that and who's more likely to seek out intimacy or relations? Um, you know, is there, is there, what, is there any truth to the, the difference there? Uh, there might be. Like, and that's the thing with gender stereotypes. They might hold up almost 100% of the time, but it doesn't explain how each individual identifies. Another thing, a big thing with uh, talking about sex research is that's all based entirely on self-report data. Um, and again, going back to the um, this history of like it being okay for males to seek that out and it being less okay, I would say today it's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. But for, historically, women weren't allowed to be interested in sex and they weren't allowed to really talk about being interested in sex. Uh, and so what you see is it's okay for a male to report that they t- think about sex a lot. But for a woman, when you're asked about sex and you know that that's not okay to talk about, you're less likely to report it, even if maybe you do actually think about it maybe as much as a male does. So, again, depends entirely on those social constructions around sexuality and how one's allowed to express it and talk about it. Um, and some other things I was, uh, I was thinking about are like, what, what kind of, I, I want to say like mental diagnoses, like depression and suicide and things like that, how that also shows up differently, um, across the genders. Yeah. So, uh, one study that, that I really like to quote a lot is, uh, Salon Kagas and colleagues. Um, they looked actually at the measurement tools, so specifically the BDIs, the Beck Depression Inventory, and the DEPS. Um, Sorry, can you say that name again? Oh, Salonka Gaz. <laughs> it's a really fun name. <laughs> uh, yeah, I might be saying it uh, wrong, but they look, so they looked at these two depression inventories, which are used frequently to determine if someone is clinically depressed, and what they found is there, so for the DEPS, uh, out of the 10 questions, there was one that was pretty gendered, and then for the BDI, which has 21 questions, three of the items were gendered. And essentially those those questions were around uh, being able to cry, which historically uh, women will more likely report and men will less likely report uh, interest in sex. And so generally that doesn't really change as much for males when they report it as mm-hmm. it does for females if they are depressed. Um, and then uh, willingness to like express or feel sad. So what they found is is really that these measures and uh, data do show that more women are diagnosed with clinical depression than males, but it can be kind of entirely a function of the tests that we're using. Oh, because interesting. Some of those things are just they're going to produce more yes answers for females than they are for males. And so what you see, sadly, is there probably are males out there that could technically qualify for clinical depression that maybe aren't getting the right treatment. Um, and females who maybe aren't quite at that level that are being treated uh, that may benefit from lesser intense interventions, if that makes sense. So what they found then was that the assessment tool itself had a gender bias built into it. Yeah, and there's kind of a lot of that around that makes it really difficult to make clinical decisions. So what about what about you, Ryan? Do you, uh, do you cry? Yes. <laughs> do, you, do you feel – I phrased that – incorrectly do you feel like you hold back your tears a lot especially because you are male do i hold back my tears because i'm male yeah i mean i've been be honest taught to do that i think by some people not really my parents um at all and i actually cried much more than other males growing up i've i've since learned it's hard to talk about now because i've like since learned a lot of different like uh, stress management, coping strategies, mm-hmm. things like that. Like mm-hmm. my life to where it's a lot easier to not hit those points, whereas it was a lot harder and different in the past. Right. So. I, I would have originally said no, except when I really was honest with myself about it. I definitely deliberately hold back a lot of the times. And it is because I, I am in the moment afraid that I'm going to be made fun of. Even if, even if no one's around, it's like, got it, got to hold it in, hold it together think about the news or maybe not the news because that's horribly depressing anymore. Think about trees. Trees are good. <laughs> you know, I'm wondering if that's different for you and your experience than Lauren personally. Like, do you feel like you hold back your tears at all or that you cry more than your male counterparts or anything like that? I would say I probably have to think about it less 
because it's been something that I'm kind of more allowed to do. Uh, so even tearing up at happy things or, you know, movies or, or different things like that, uh, there are rarely times where I feel like I have to hide it from the people in the room that I'm crying. Um, I usually just let it <laughs> let it come out. Um, but I, but again, I don't, you know, that could be, I'm sure that's a function of my history, but also I've never had to think about specifically suppressing it. Hmm. Maybe there were a few times where, you know, I was in a situation where a lot of people were looking and I didn't want to appear, uh, weak, I guess, mm -hmm. but I haven't encountered those situations very often. Is gender or gender studies related in any way to feminism or is that completely different or what do you think? Well, feminism is just, uh, you know, it's really a movement to promote women's rights. Okay. Um, and so especially in the 60s is when kind of feminism really picked up and when a lot of movement happened. They're definitely related in that both will talk about how historically it's usually women have been oppressed. It's not just females in the workplace. They do a lot of things with LGBT community. Um, it's essentially like minorities or people who historically have been disenfranchised in one way or the another. It gets, um, it's more you see feminism. more dimorphism mm -hmm. like at higher levels. So like how Ryan talked about like PhD level or MDs are more likely to still be male. And then mm -hmm. Fortune 500 companies what is it, one to five percent are actually ran by women? You sure. still see those big gaps, and like you still see more female nurses. And um, actually, that kind of gets into some of that um, transgender individuals' experiences. So, there's a lot of experiences where males as nurses you get promoted faster because they're like, oh, you shouldn't be here. And then females who kind of remain, but for specifically, um, so Connell just did this. She interviewed a bunch of transgender individuals in their workplaces. Mm -hmm. And they talked about um, the situations that were most cool were when their coworkers didn't know that the person was either male or female prior to coming into the experience. And so you see like one female that... Um, became a male she was a security guard and a he I should say and then so was fine at that level but then later once he was officially a he a bunch of people were like you shouldn't just be a security guard you should be a police officer and so like you see just all those different experiences and it was kind of cool because with transgender individuals you can kind of see that they lived on both divides so they're able to see like in their own lifetime what that looked like versus you know Ryan has a different experience than I do but I actually like lived through being treated differently, even though I'm the same person. So in Connell's uh, same article, there was an individual who um, was a scientist and was reporting kind of their scientific data. And they went from uh, female to male. And from, I think it was over the course of a couple years. What did they change their name to? They did change their name. Okay. And what was interesting is the first time the male presented their data, again, on all the same subject, everything, they had people come up and say, man, this is really good. Um, your sister's work isn't as good, though. <laughs> so they thought be that the mm -hmm. other name that was the feminine name was this person's sister exactly. when it was the same person and it was the same work. And it, but, but it was a male and even though it, everything was the same, they'd been doing the same stuff, um, said that the sister's work wasn't as good as, as uh, his was. So, You know, something, uh, and we don't have to go into this if it's too far into the feminism territory, but there was the argument that women just make different career choices in life and that they don't make as much money because they stop to go have babies and, or, you know, that's, that the pay gap that exists really is only because women choose careers that don't pay as much. So can you speak to some of that? Or so, if you don't want to, you don't have to, but. Yeah, that's kind of a difficult territory only because when women do leave to have babies, that just naturally produces a gap where they're not getting promoted. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if another person stayed at that company in that job for so long, they would just, you know, be making more and potentially get promoted over that period of time. Uh, so there is kind of some truth to the fact that women will make less if they're not present in the workplace. Um, but 
there still is a gap, uh, even if you kind of take out some of those factors. And especially when you get to high level positions, so I was just saying that the Fortune 500 companies, um, I can't remember current data, but I believe it's one to 5% are uh, run by female CEOs. So most of them are, are males. Most MDs, again, um, I believe are males. You still kind of see some of those those differences. And there are careers, I think Ryan kind of mentioned this a little bit, there's careers where you see more males than females. Um, and you do really see that, you know, glass ceiling effect where um, the analogy is that uh, there's a glass ceiling, women can't break through it, but they can see what the top looks like and mm-hmm. it's better than where they are. We, we talked a little bit about the sexual dimorphism in terms of physicality, size, shape, um, physical strength. Men tend to have more upper body strength. And, and to an extent, there, uh, there's also that uh, women tend to have smaller brains. And you, you probably know a lot about this as well, that brain size correlates to body size. Um, and we've talked, we've talked about brains on this show a few times. And one thing that I don't know if we've actually mentioned before is brain size does not correlate to intelligence. There's that aspect of it, but there's a lot, it's a lot more complicated than just size when it comes to like gender studies. So could you, could you speak to some of the research, especially the more recent research on neurology and how that shows us if, if males and females are different um, in their brains and the sizes and how they work and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. So historically, uh, you guys probably already dispelled this, but historically, things such as uh, women's brains being smaller, they called it the missing five ounces of the female brain, and <laughs> and used that as an example of why women weren't as smart. Again, this was in a time where they didn't teach women many things that the males knew, so, you know, essentially just confirmed their theory. Things like a uh, the corpus callosum being larger in males, they've used that to try to explain why males and females are smarter. Uh, males are smarter than females. Um, they also, there was this one funny one where it was called the delicacy of the female brain fibers. They thought that if they push them too much to learn things, that those fibers would break. <laughs> that was that one out. That's f-ing ridiculous. So... <laughs> Uh, that's, that's really funny. Uh, that is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I know that uh, the term hysteria refers to is uh, actually means the wandering womb in Greek. The, uh, the you think of a hysterectomy is the removal of the uterus, or I guess the wandering uterus. And that uh, when someone is is being hysterical, it is always a woman, and it is because her uterus is wandering aimlessly around her body, and so she is freaking out. She's throwing a fit. Um, she's hysterical. Um, cause she's, uh, cause her uterus is, is on a walkabout. And that goes right along with, uh, data on PMS and oh, menstrual yeah. issues. Um, that's also been an excuse for a long time as to why women can't participate in things is they might make bad decisions when they are on their period. All right. So what else goes on with brain and gender? So anymore, uh, people are more seeing that, your brain essentially is a function of your history and your history with things. And so Joel and colleagues, um, actually more recently, 2015, I believe, looked at brain scans in relation to kind of gendered stereotypes. And they they found what they called the human brain mosaic, uh, essentially referring to that what they saw was kind of patterns of masculine and feminine features in these brains, kind of how they responded uh, to different questions that were either masculine or feminine. There were rarely um, situations where the brain kind of reflected totally a male, uh, like responses to male things and totally responses to feminine things. And now uh, one thing that that wasn't done, they didn't look a lot at fMRIs and those are kind of more of a, a better look at uh, moment-to-moment changes We're rather than just this. MRIs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so that was kind of one uh, critique of that study. But anymore, there are still a lot of people that research brains and talk about how they're very gendered. Simon Byrne Cohen, for example, mm-hmm. has talked about the sympathetic e-brain as being kind of feminine and the S-brain being more mathematically oriented. 
and related to males. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, his data show that less than 50% of the women had the e-brain that he studied, um, and 17% of the males had had an e-brain. So, so anymore you see, and I think, again, this is uh, entirely a product of, you know, what's culturally acceptable, um, the fact that people have different histories, is you really see that everyone's just different, and they're going to embrace different things at different points in time, depending on their history, um, and depending on, you know, if they're in a culture where it establishes that it's okay to engage in masculine and feminine activities, to, you know, uh, independent of one's biological sex. There's some more in the history of, of gender with respect to um, Hogwarts, um, specifically witchcraft and wizardry. <laughs> um, so can you speak a little bit about uh, the issues in gender with respect to like this idea of witchcraft and witches and that sort of thing? Yeah, so Bever did a really excellent kind of uh, article uh, looking kind of at the data around witchcraft and actually dispelling. So, for instance, I'll just ask you guys, so what what are some things you think of when I say, you know, what what is a witch or who is a witch? What are some features of a person that might be a witch? I'm tempted to think of Maggie Smith, but going to the like Halloween store stereotype of a witch, I'm imagining warts and green skin, similar to the Wizard of Oz depiction, hunched old haggard woman with a pointy hat and a black cat who rides a, b a broom like Hocus Pocus. Anything that was like else? three movie references in 30 seconds. I think you described my, what I see a witch ass. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in general, they were thought of like old. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that. Uh, usually they were also thought of to be very poor and kind of outside of their community and not really participating in things. Mm -hmm. But really what they found, uh, data on witchcraft, and interestingly, this didn't happen as frequently um, but there were communities where more males were accused of witchcraft. Um, it was purely a, a function of wherever you were at the geographical location and what was happening at that time. Uh, but what they found is uh, the people that were more likely to be accused of witchcraft were females, but it was totally around economic situations. So um, these women tended to be married, um, and they were integral parts of their community, which I think really resulted in why those conflicts were happening is someone, you know, so to speak, pissed me off. And now if I accuse them of witchcraft, that's a really big uh, thing that can result in that threat being gone. And again, they weren't necessarily poor. They were generally middle class. So when you look at their actual data of what these people actually were, um, our conceptions of what witches were, is very different, and it's totally dependent upon just <clears throat> what was going on at that specific point in time. And uh, this, I think, really what came of this, too, is one reason why perhaps females were more likely to be accused of witchcraft was there weren't a lot of appropriate outlets uh, to engage in revenge or to get back at somebody uh, around... For example, so women aren't really allowed to be physically aggressive, uh, whereas males, you know, if they had a, a beef with somebody, for example, they might just, you know, fist fight or have a duel or different things like that. Right, and whereas, they duel a lot. Yes. Well, and historically, that's never been appropriate for women. And so a lot of times what you see is women engaging in kind of more of that verbal conflict. And witchcraft was a really, really effective way of getting rid of your threat you mean accusing someone of witchcraft? Yes. Okay. So I guess I just want to make sure that I'm summarizing this appropriately and some of the things that we've discussed around issues of gender and, you know, I guess feminism and um, equalities is wrapped up inside of this and some of the issues that arise around what it means to be a, a part of a gender identity and how that can affect your behavior and the how people react to you is that first of all to make the distinction that sex refers to only the biological characteristics and gender refers to how one identifies with respect to the cultural expectations that are associated with that sex okay so you have those masculine behaviors and that those are really uh what shows up for people in terms of 
identifying as either male or female or masculine or feminine is influenced by what are the circumstances of their culture and their upbringing and the, the, how people react and respond to them, what are the expectations are for them. And it just, it just depends. And it, it could be anything. So if in one culture, something is depicted as being masculine and another culture that might be depicted as being, or that might be uh, viewed as feminine and vice versa. So what is a particular gender is not a black and white thing. It only is, it, it just depends on the culture and the times of that culture. Cause even across the culture, it can shift. And so, um, gender is this, uh, this kind of nebulous idea and is not binary necessarily. Um, but it has sort of a spectrum of, um, just what is relevant for a given culture and that those circumstances for those individuals are going to be the conditions under which they are going to behave in a particular way. Because as you mentioned, the, the people that are around them are either going to, uh, treat them, I guess, negatively, uh, if they behave outside of what those gendered expectations are or treat them positively if they're beha- behaving inside of what those gendered expectations are, um, or, there might be some other type of reaction that they have where it's just sort of a, we don't know how to react to this, so we're just going to ignore them sort of thing. So does that sort of summarize how we've just talked about the role of how the culture in, is involved in, in gender? Yes. Okay. All right. What, what, do, you, what do you got, Ryan? Well, it was nice and succinct. Um, I guess the only thing I had to still contribute was just like if people were looking for this to be like a resource to help on these sort of things, like that's – not really what we're functioning as, mm-hmm. and there's resources out there if you're looking for them. I yeah. usually refer people to start start by looking at the American Psychological Association website. So it's APA.org. And we can also link to the books and articles that you referenced in here and uh, in the show notes so anybody can access those and, and read through those. Um, I've, I've read parts of those books, never all the way cover to cover, but uh, they get some really cool stuff in there. I liked the, the Cordelia Fine Delusions of Gender was really good. It's a very easy read, too. Yeah. If you had one to suggest as, like, a starting place to jump off, what would it be? The Delusions of Gender. It's a really easy read. There's not a lot of complicated language. Okay. Yeah, and I sat backseat on a lot of this just because I actually don't know really much at all on this topic, so I'm going to jump into that one myself. Yeah. (laughs) Wow, Ryan just got a free book. (laughs) (laughs) I just got my copy. This is awesome. (laughs) Uh, You need to have that read by the next time we record. (laughs) It's not signed. (laughs) <laughs> well, she didn't write it. <laughs> okay, so uh, one thing I wanted to end on then is what, what in your opinion is important about studying gender? Like, why should is is it necessary to have this discussion? Why should people be aware of this? Uh, you know, what is there to know about this? I guess. Uh, I think it's important too. I I know I kind of talked about a lot of the social constructions around why men and women you know, end up being different. And it's not to say that biology doesn't play a part. It of course does. Um, If you're looking for a really good discussion around the nature and nurture, uh, the importance of both of those and how they're always intertwined, I would look at Susan Schneider's Science of Consequences book. Uh, It's a really good discussion of all that. But in pointing out that those are a function. So for example, males are stronger. Data data indicate that on average Um, on average yeah yeah. well in general yes um and that could perhaps always be the case um you know even if we change some of our social kind of constructions around allowing females to participate equally in some of these different sports and things that males are allowed to do um could i just wanted to say do you think it could be the case that if we were to culturally begin to select um, the or what we believe as being attractive is like masculine characteristics in women, so women who are taller, bigger built, and more muscular, that we might actually start to so, sort of in a way selectively breed women who are more biologically more likely to be taller, stronger, and um, have more masculine features. Is well, that a possibility? Do you think? That's always a possibility. Okay. Um, and I'm not saying you know we should or shouldn't do one or either or both or any of those. It's really just pointing out that whenever you're making a discussion or talking specifically about what's a masculine thing to do, what's a feminine thing to do, and who's going to be better, you really have to consider all of the different things that are going to influence how a person is able to behave um, given certain circumstances, what they're able to do, etc. And so, as I was saying, if even if, you know, it could be true that males will always be stronger, they'll always be faster. 
Um, but really what we're seeing is that if you allow people to equally participate in things, uh, you might see some pretty incredible differences. So it's just important to point out that it's not just biology. It really is a lot of those social constructions around how people are allowed to behave that influence our biological makeup and our structure and whether I have more muscle mass than um, Ryan, for example. Cool. All right. Uh, I mean, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today and share your expertise in this area. Um, I definitely learned a lot. And um, I mean, do you have anything else you want to close out with? Not really. Uh, there's There are a ton of resources around, you know, if, if you feel like you're a member um, or might be a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, there are so many resources out there um, that are really amazing. And so if, if you were listening to this kind of for that reason, um, I would just really seek out a lot of those um, different different resources in your community. Do you want to be available to people that like email and ask questions or what we can actually, let's do this. Anybody who's interested in asking questions, um, send them to info at www.podcast.com and we can always forward those on to Lauren, um, and she can respond to those, um, or we'll, we'll field them first. So anything crazy will filter out, <laughs> um, but reasonable questions, if that's okay, we can pass those on and you can potentially answer some questions, maybe even just provide some links to resources or whatever. So mm -hmm. cool. Cool. All right. Well, um, just to wrap up, I guess, with uh, unrelated to that um, is for anybody who has been listening and, and joined the show um, and you want to help out but maybe don't have a lot of money like me, <laughs> um, you can always go. Uh, one thing that really helps is just subscribing to the podcast. That really helps the algorithm out that puts it up so that it, more people are likely to hear it, which means that uh, we're more likely to show up in those feeds and, and reach more people. That's always great. Um, if you uh, like the show and want to leave a positive review, we always appreciate that sort of thing um, in iTunes. Um, even anything short, you know, a couple sentences uh, is, is totally great. That really helps uh, helps us with the, the, with the algorithm that shows up on iTunes and, and other, you know, Google Play, wherever you listen to this. I keep saying iTunes, but there's a lot of different places you could be listening to this. Um, that any Anything you leave as a review really helps out the show. So um, that's uh, that's all we got for now, I think. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for everyone's time and listening. Yeah. And again, thanks for Lauren for being here. Abraham, and Lauren, and Ryan O. Signing off. listening to Why We Do What We Do. Why We Do What We Do is supported in part by ABAI's Disseminating Behavior Analysis Special Interest Group and our amazing listeners. If you like what you heard, consider heading to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash podcast. Anything helps, and we are continuously lining up perks and merch for our supporters. If you have any comments or questions, we'd love to hear from you. Find us at WWD Podcast on your favorite social media platforms. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. There, you'll find links as well as detailed and shareable show notes. Why We Do What We Do is Abraham, Ryan O, and Miranda. Artwork and logo design by Andrew Pollock at nogdesigns.com. Video and production assistance from Tyler Brassier with music courtesy of Justin Greenhouse. Brendan Bohr does our episode art. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day. Hey.